at the crossroads. There are folks who vibrate in fragments of freedom, but machine gun economics has become our daily bread, for better or for worse. And now they got us blinking buckshots during a time when the American businesses like to say, jump, worker, or else I'll pull the trigger on your job. I said, jump, chill. We want our culture rich, our poetics rhythmically ridiculous with wordsmiths who smash the corporate construct of how this, our work, our poetry is done. So from the most high, we would like to accept this blessing and do what we do, ad ridiculi. Lyrically out of control, causing those who see our work, the vibe chameleon wicked way of the world to recompose your breathing patterns before you call the police. Sometimes the audience is a rearranged angle screaming, security, security. What type of poetry is this? Please explain. Yo, this is our work. And when we roll the way we roll, this is how it's done in our house, the earth. And there will be no more pictures on your movie screen of the art getting skinny while those that got keep getting fat. And we, yo, we be sucking the sweat from between our teeth. Nah, cause this is our house, the earth, and our heroes are grandmothers who walk the streets with black boots and plastic bags. They be mothers left behind to raise profits with one hand and build castles of ash with the other. Cause this be our house, the earth, and when we up in it, it's like blah! Ways of cataclysm, breaking down walls, wrapping the world in a bear hug of ecstasy so fat that trees that root themselves to swing to our song at the crossroads. Welcome to Labor at the Crossroads, the monthly show focusing on labor and working people here in New York City. I'm Janine Jackson. The topic today is one of immediate concern for us here at the show. We're talking about the drastic budget cuts facing the City University of New York, part of which go to fund this program. Proposed state cuts to CUNY amount to 25% of its budget and will certainly lead to the loss of faculty, the elimination of classes and programs, and a tuition hike that may make it impossible for many working adults who make up a good portion of CUNY students to continue going to school. But coming as they do in the current political climate, these cuts have led many of us to ask whether it's really a matter of economic pragmatism or an ideological assault on the goals and ideals of public education itself. With us today to discuss the situation at CUNY are Sandy Cooper, professor of history at the College of Staten Island and the Graduate School, and the chair of the University Faculty Senate, and Blanche Wiesen Cook, professor of history at John Jay College and the Graduate Center, and the author of, among other books, Eleanor Roosevelt. The two recently co-authored an op-ed for the New York Times that was entitled The Trashing of CUNY. I'd like to start with you, Sandy. Uh, I have a feeling that many viewers may not know that until 1976, CUNY provided tuition-free education for New Yorkers. What can we learn? Certainly, the current crisis is not the first that CUNY has faced. What can we learn from the history, uh, both of CUNY's history and the history of assaults on CUNY? But then I'd like you to say what you think is different about the, the present okay. moment. Well, that you ask about 1975 and 6 is wonderful because just two days ago somebody found a circular that we did in 1975 about the first major crisis advertising a speak out at Hunter College. The list of the speakers is very familiar because some of us are still at it. Twenty years ago there was purportedly a, a crisis in the financing of New York City's public services. 
which led to the elimination of the City University senior colleges as a part of the City of New York. They were moved to the state budget. The senior colleges and a part of the funding of the community colleges became a piece of the whole state system, though not part of the State University of New York. And the deal that was struck then imposed tuition on our undergraduates and graduates for the first time in the history since 1847 when City College was the, the flagship institution that opened. The deal also, however, made a promise, what I call a social contract, that those poor students whose family income was on the poverty line would never have to pay tuition. They were promised something called TAP, tuition assistance. It also led to the creation of state legislation, special legislation, which enabled the higher education opportunity programs to be funded at the privates and the publics in New York. That led to SEEK in the senior colleges, CD, college discovery in the two-year colleges. And those uh, programs were targeted at the poorest of the poor, people who have nine and 8,000 a year income, family income, and whose academic average is poor but who need, who with a good deal of counseling and extra supports can make it through. We now have 20 years of judges, college professors, all kinds of people who came through SEEK, lawyers. What is different now? The magnitude of the cuts is of such a nature that it throws this from a qualitative to a quantitative difference. Where the last time we were cut a few years ago under Cuomo, we lost 40 million, we are now faced with 160 million about as a cut. Secondly, this proposed budget of Pataki's breaks the social contract of 1975. It breaks it on the grounds that it's been a failure. The statement that it's been a failure is the result of manipulated statistics by hostile group, folks out there who claim they are just being fiscally responsible. And I mean, I could go on, but I think that's the sort of broad outline of the, of the difference. There's one other major difference that I am very disturbed by between the last 75 crisis, at least the last one in our lifetime, and this one. And that is in those days, the Board of Trustees defended us. Now we have a number who are out to get us, that is, who agree that these cuts are viable and legitimate. And that makes a serious difference in how we can argue for ourselves. I would say, finally, if you go back more than 20 years, if you go back 60 years to the Depression, you will see that instead of cutting public higher education, which was free, the city of New York founded two new colleges to add opportunity in Brooklyn and Queens for people. And they extended Hunter into the Bronx, which is now Lehman. So in the first of the major economic crises of the 20th century, they didn't downsize. They grew it. They provided more opportunity. It's so different times now and a whole different different response. We do we are in a different climate now. I, I just you know Sandy has just hit the nail right on the head. I mean I I've been walking around saying this is the meanest moment in American life and if you look at the assault on young people, the assault on the, the hard-working students of this city, it really is a major American atrocity, a major American tragedy. Let me just say two things. Both Sandy and I went through various colleges at the City University. I mean, I went to Hunter, you went to City. When, we, when I was at Hunter in the 50s, not only was there free tuition, but we had our books, our textbooks were free. There was a sense of total support for the hard-working students. We had scholarships. If you needed a scholarship, there were scholarships. There were work programs. I worked all through the four years. Um, there was real support. Now they are cutting everything, including, when you think about it, all of the support before you get into college. And so it is, it is really an awesome kind of thing. And I think that what we in the city of New York have to deal with, and all of us who are activists, and I have to say this is certainly a moment when we all need to be activists, we've really got to reorganize, regroup, and fight. And we have to realize that we're looking at two things. One, 
an incredible meanness, and I love Sandy's expression, the, the, the shredding of the social contract. This is the only country in the world that has declared war on its own people and war on the future by trashing children, by saying children count least. We are not going to support children. We are not going to provide any benefits for children. And to break the social contract when it comes to education, this is an amazing moment. And particularly uh, Orwellian when you think that education has so often been pointed to as the way up in this Absolutely. country and to be making cuts to education particularly it, for working adults it's and horrific. at the same time cuts to public assistance it's where where are people to go what are people what, to do what are people to do now you hear a lot about this is really you know we're going to be saving money if you look at how much it costs to keep a youth a male or female youth in prison it costs eighty thousand dollars to keep somebody at Ossining for a year. How many students would be supported for $80,000? I mean, think of it. So there, there is a lot of deceit here. There are many lies. There's a lot of propaganda. This is a war against the American people. The other piece to this war is why isn't everybody already on the streets jumping up and down? We're all, there are many movements and so on, but there's a race factor. And a lot of people are not dealing with that race factor. This war against CUNY really began with open enrollment, mm -hmm. okay? As soon as we had open enrollment and we said, we really mean it, we are going to integrate mm -hmm. Hunter, we're going to integrate City College, we're going to integrate John Jay College where I teach, we mean it. We're going to have open enrollment and we're going to supply support services for hardworking students who want to learn. Then the naysayers started. And they have a whole industry. And, and, part and that of, industry is loud. And it's partly said, and you talked about the statistics they used to prove this, part of what they're saying is this very open enrollment, which was a goal, uh, a social goal, well, that's dragging down the standards of education. And they really turn out to be not such good students. That's right. Well, one of the reasons, the, uh, one of the arguments which claims that our students are not such good students is that they don't graduate in a reasonable amount of time. They need, if they do graduate, they take six to eight years. Well, they obviously take six to eight years because they're not traditional students. The largest number of our students are women now. It's a different university. Many of the campuses, not all, are majority students of color, of various backgrounds. We are developing an immense student body from overseas. By the year 2000, we may have almost 60% almost of an enrollment of first-generation immigrants. I mean, the immigrants themselves, not the children of immigrants. Um, this is anything but a traditional student body. I could go on. I, mean, I have, on my campus, a large number of adults go only on the weekends because they work full-time. You can't possibly finish in four years if you go on weekends. So, one of the arguments that, you know, suggests that the students are not very good is that they don't graduate in four to six years. But without taking any social context into account, that's deliberate. But, you know, let me just also make a, a long-term observation. Um, I've been on a few, at a few meetings recently and listening to people, and I am becoming persuaded that in more and more folks who are incapable of dealing with the social crisis we have in the late 20th century in this country, will eventually be seduced into, the, into buying into that argument in the bell curve, which suggests that we're going to have to develop reservations for those who cannot function in the electronic technology culture. That is, the work of the future is not going to be able to employ the population we have and particularly an uneducated and poorly prepared population. And one of the suggestions buried somewhere in the middle of those hundreds of pages of that book is the creation of something resembling Indian reservations, which will be cheaper than Asaning. It's not going to cost $80,000 well, a head. It, it seems very clear we have a choice. And that choice, and this is why we wrote the op-ed that we wrote, Sandy's point, and she has compiled all the statistics, we have educated people from all over the world. If you go to a, a, a graduate center graduation, if you go to a Hunter or John Jay graduation, we have students from over 70 nations. 
they are educated, they graduate, and they become teachers, social workers, physicians, nurses. They become taxpayers. taxpayers. 400 Four, million that's in right. tax money and in the last And to generation. say we are not, we are going to withdraw the American promise, the American dream of educating Americans mm -hmm. is an atrocity. We have historical antecedents. It's called fascism. But those words become meaningless when you look at this homegrown atrocity. So we have to organize. We have to fight back. We have to restore the American commitment to educate America. That is the primary need and the primary thing that we must do. And every student is involved. Every faculty member is involved. If those faculty members who think our students are not educable believe that, they should resign. We don't need There's those an early people. There's retirement uh, proposal coming up. Because I, I have taught here for over 30 years. Sandy has. We know our students are wonderful. They are hardworking. They're not traditional. They come to class with their children. They come to class at night. They, they are working people, working mothers and fathers. Men and women have brought their children to my classes. I can swear to it. I mean, this is such a vulgar, mean moment, and we just have to resist it. And I mean, I believe we will prevail. I think the vision of the 30s needs to be restored. It's kind of wonderful to be writing about Eleanor Roosevelt, who protested all of these cuts in the 1930s, and there are thousands of people protesting them now. I really believe that we will prevail, but we do have to what? Active, activate. I'm afraid we're going to have to end with that sense of urgency, entirely appropriate in what we've talked about as very mean times. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests very much, Blanche, Blanche Wiesen Cook, uh, professor of history at John Jay College and author of Eleanor Roosevelt, and also Sandy Cooper, professor of history at the College of Staten Island and the chair of the University Faculty Senate. Thank you both for being on Labor at thank the Crossroads. You, thank you. Thank you. about the history of the attacks on CUNY and on open education. Now we're going to talk about what's happening now, and in particular, the activist response. With us is Nicole Hostin, New York City Legislative Associate for NYPIRG. That's the New York Public Interest Research Group. Welcome to Labor at the Crossroads. Thank you. First of all, tell us what NYPIRG has been doing in response to the education cuts, and why, why did this fit with the other kinds of work that NYPIRG does? Well, NYPIRG is an organization that's tw over 20 years old. It's a student-directed, student-founded, student-initiative activist organization. And our commitment is to working on social justice, um, public policy, good government, environmental and consumer issues. This issue is related to students, obviously, because they are attending college and trying to get an education. It's also an issue of a public, it's a public interest issue because we're talking about publicly funded, publicly supported uh, institutions of higher education. And so it's not just a self-interest that motivates students, but an interest in making sure that higher education is accessible and affordable to all. And so we've been working on higher education issues for many, many years. And as you mentioned, there is a, there is a deliberate and a very strong attack against the concept of supporting fu publicly funded colleges and universities. And students understand this. And part of that is to understand the information and to have access to it. So our response was initially to let people be informed because information gives people access. And if you put information together with access, you have power. And we may not have power financially, but we have power collectively. And there are thousands, thousands of students that are going to be affected in this city. And it's not just the students, it's the families and the surrounding communities that support 
those schools, those students, and everyone. So for example, if a student is affected, their parents are going to be affected. If people work in the colleges, in the libraries, in the cafeterias, in the classrooms as professors, when those jobs are lost, that also has an impact on higher education. So it's not just confined to students. Um, our immediate response was to let people know the severity of these cuts and to let people know that CUNY was facing a $162 million cut. And what did that mean? That meant a potential tuition increase anywhere between $1,000 and $1,800 we're hearing. Uh, the loss of over 10,000 class sections, which means that students can't graduate in a timely manner, which means that professors are losing their jobs, which means that schools can't afford to buy books. All of the services are going down. And as a consumer issue, it doesn't make sense. Students are paying more and more, and they're getting less value for their money. And this is, this is not the first tuition hike. This is not, and it will not be the last until students get together and get organized. And this is what's happening. Um, we heard a little bit, actually, that the activism had been slow to start. People were saying to me, why aren't the students fighting back? Is it that they were, but they perhaps were not coordinated? What's your feeling? I think students were there and are there, and they have been coordinated, and the response hasn't been slow, but I think it's very different. People are looking at constituencies that not only are loud and vocal, but that can have a political impact. Legislators care largely about one thing and that is getting re-elected. So their attention is directed to people whom they feel will vote them in or vote them out. So part of our goal is not just to educate students, but to empower them by getting them registered to vote. Because politicians know that if you're, if you're registered, more likely is that you're going to vote. And our goal is to ensure that students couple their activism with their political clout at the ballot box. Doesn't matter how they register for which party or for whom, but that they can exercise their political voice by stroking the pen or pulling that lever, as well as taking to other measures. So registering people to vote was an important first step because students are under-registered. Part of that is moving away to school. Part of that is changing apartments. Part of that is the difficulty in having the ballot be accessible to you. But that was one of our first steps. Um, and secondly, we. Um, at NYPIRG, in coordination with student governments, administrations, faculty, student groups on all campuses, are involved in a coalition called the Movement to Reinvest in Education, or MORE. Mm -hmm. And this coalition got together, and we did a desk drop uh, leaflets in all the classrooms and schools across the state. And we dropped 100,000 um, postcards address so that people could communicate to their senators and their assembly members. And in early February, 200,000 postcards were sent up to Albany from CUNY and SUNY students saying, don't cut funds to higher education. It's penny wise and pound foolish. If you think you're saving now, if the idea is to spurn the economy by having educated, informed individuals who can graduate, get a job, become taxpaying, become productive, cutting higher education doesn't make sense. And on the other hand, you're cutting welfare. So what you're really doing is creating social havoc and upheaval. Students understand that the way for them to get an opportunity is to get an education. They don't want to be on welfare. They don't want to be an economic burden. They want to be a contributing, productive member of society. You cannot do that without an education. They know that that degree is your ticket to access through the door. It's the way it has become. And uh, it's very flip and cold of both the mayor and the governor and the federal government to respond to students by saying, get a job, work more, work harder. Students are already working. They've been working for years. Overwhelmingly, Over CUNY, students are, CUNY students are working adults. Exactly. Working adults that are parents. They may be going to school full-time and working part-time. Many are working part-time, or sorry, working full-time, going part-time. But many of them, you know, they've always had jobs. This is not an issue of not wanting to, um, you know, lift yourself. But you cannot... You cannot do it alone. And the thing is, what the state and the city invest now, they get twofold back. Because CUNY students stay in the city, they become the economic support structure for the city. So what have you been doing, apart from the, the, the leafleting, the pamphleting, which sounded very successful, have you been doing any visible external things? Yes, the leafleting was a start to get people to let people have the numbers and understand what the impact would be. But the next level is to take it to an actual activity, to do something. Um, a lot of people can attend meetings, find things out, but they really crave to have some sort of impact. What can I do to make a difference? And that's what we're all about, is giving people the opportunity by giving them skills, training, and information to go out and make a difference. So uh, students had a rally in Albany on February 27th that 
between eight and 9,000 students attended. It was incredible, students from community colleges, senior colleges, upstate, downstate, all getting together in one massive voice saying, no cuts, we are here, we are this, the future of this state and the cities of this state, don't cut CUNY. Uh, at the same time as students were rallying uh, the Capitol, over 150 delegation visits were set up, so students were lobbying their senators and their assembly members, speaking directly to their own elected officials about the impact of the cuts and then urging them not to cut CUNY and SUNY. And as time has gone by, we've continued to do more work. Now we are we're stepping up the ante because we have up until April 1st when the budget is passed to have an impact on the process. And if you don't raise your voice, then you're going to be ignored. It's very easy for legislators to try and ignore people that they feel don't vote or that aren't making repeated um, efforts to say, do not cut this service, this program. And students are saying higher education should be a priority. And so the goal is to keep that pressure on until April the 1st. Among the other things that we're doing is the students on the campuses are setting up civic centers. And these civic centers are supposed to be um, educational places where people can go and find out who their senator is if they don't know, who their assembly member is if they don't know. And that's a very empowering step for students to find out who their representatives are. And they're given the t addresses and telephone numbers both in the city and in Albany for their representatives. And we have phones set up right at the Civic Center so they can call right away and make a phone call and register their voice saying don't cut CUNY and SUNY. And you're also giving them democratic skills and information that clearly will be useful beyond the current Exactly. Situation. They can take that information that they know and they can contact their legislators about other issues that are important. It starts that whole dialogue of conversing with your legislators because after all, you elect them. They are your representatives and you should be talking to them. So that's one other thing that we're doing. Um, we have, we're setting up delegation visits in the city because for many students it's difficult to take time off work and school because if the governor and the mayor don't know it, they're already working to make the delegation visits uh, closer to home. And all legislators have offices in the district. So for those students that are interested, we're going to be setting up delegation visits here in the city so they can go in their district. Um, we have a letter writing campaign as well where students are writing letters uh, and we're providing paper and envelopes if they need. But we're really just trying to get people to take the time right now and make that action. Don't think about it. Don't procrastinate. Because if students don't get up and do it for themselves now, no one else will. And that's the important message. Thank you very much, Nicole Hostin. Nicole Hostin is the New York City Legislative Associate for NYPIRG. I mentioned at the start of the show that budget cuts to CUNY affect labor at the crossroads directly. In fact, we've just learned that a large and vital portion of our budget will no longer be available after March, which means this may be the last show we can afford to produce for now. We're going to continue our fundraising and our activism, and we hope to be able to bring you more programming about labor and working people in New York. If you'd like to know how you can help keep the program going, look for the information at the end of the show. For now, we thank you for watching, and we appreciate your support. I'm Janine Jackson for Labor at the Crossroads.